Okay, so thank you very much, Professor Gopinath, for making the time for this chat. And uh, first of all, I'd like to raise um, uh, the topic of, of this very interesting paper that you have just uh, published uh, with a clear proposal for essentially developed country to do more to help the vaccination campaign in the developing uh, world. And, and you show very clear figures uh, that uh, it's not so much the rich versus the poor, it's the vaccinated versus the, un versus the unvaccinated. Can you give us uh, a summary of your proposal and what's the rationale uh, behind it, first of all? Thank you, Federico. Firstly, it's a pleasure to speak to you. The proposal that we have put out, firstly, just recognizes what is obvious at this point, that the economic crisis is not over until the health crisis is over. And as public health officials have reminded us multiple times over, the pandemic is not over anywhere. The health crisis is not over anywhere until it's over everywhere. So if you look at where the world is now in terms of the prospects of a durable end to the health crisis, it unfortunately does not look good. Uh, we are in a situation where we have the good news of multiple successful vaccines. Uh, we also have the news that there is sufficient supply coming in the pipeline. There's quite a bit of vaccine supply coming in the pipeline. The problem, of course, is right now that vaccine is highly inequitable. There are countries in the world where you have vaccinated 40, 50 percent of the population. And then you have countries, for instance, in Africa, where even the healthcare workers have not been vaccinated. And if you project forward, which is what we did in the proposal, based on all the bilateral deals, the regional deals, the COVAX deals, about what the world will look like in the end of 2021, unfortunately, this deep inequality will persist. So what we are providing in this proposal is three things. One is targets that we think are plausible targets for every country to vaccinate at least 40% of its population by the end of 2021, and at least 60% by the first half of next year. And then we are providing very clear actions that are needed to accomplish that vaccination, those vaccination targets. But then also looking at what's needed on the financing side to make those actions happen. Uh, and also the, what's needed in terms of diagnostics and therapeutics to make sure that before we get to a point where we've actually ended the health crisis, that there is enough tracking of what's happening with virus and mutations, that there is enough diagnostics and therapeutics so that people can tie their own ways. And that whole proposal amounts to about $50 billion, of which, you know, in terms of billions might sound like a large number, but the gain from having doing this, uh, these policies right and getting much faster end to this health crisis is about $9 trillion over the next four years. Uh, so this is a very, very, it's, it's completely obvious that it needs to be done. And our hope is that this proposal, which basically brings together many different aspects of the fight against the pandemic, will play a useful role in addition to all the very useful, very valuable work that's been done by the WHO, the World Bank, Gavi, the ACT Accelerator, and many other institutions who are we are now closely working with. Um, you know, uh, while I was reading your paper, um, I couldn't help but thinking that uh, developed countries are in a conundrum. Uh, uh, of course, there are very good humanitarian reasons why they should do more and they should share uh, their uh, doses, extra doses with other countries that are not so fortunate. But then, even from a practical point of view, uh, there are conflicting interests there. Because the reason, of course, uh, the EU, the US, Canada, the UK have over-ordered, and probably uh, in, talking about Europe, we have at least twice as many doses are, uh, as are needed to cover with full courses the whole population. The US is pretty much in a similar position and so on and so forth. Maybe Canada is even more overordered, but we don't make a commitment to share. 
because in the end, in the back of uh, policymakers' mind is the idea that we don't know when we are going to need a booster shot. So we don't want to get rid of the extra doses. On the other hand, if we don't, we don't help uh, Africa vaccinate faster, we increase the likelihood that there might be uh, mutations there. So, and maybe one of the variants might be, uh, you know, our vaccines might be ineffective against uh, one of the new variants. So it's, it's a conundrum. And uh, how do you think it should be solved? So first, if Federico, if you, uh, if what we've done is we've looked at how much surplus vaccines have been ordered, right? So if you say every country is going to vaccinate 75% of its population, which is way more than anybody has gotten to, uh, you know, even taking into account vaccine hesitancy and everything, this is, we're looking at, if you look at eight high income countries, um, between them, they have ordered excess of 2 billion doses, right? 2 billion doses. So even if they give up, they only donate 1 billion of those 2 billion doses, in our calculation, that goes, takes us a long way towards getting to this 40% target for low income countries by the end of this year. Secondly, there are certain vaccines that some countries are not going to use. So for instance, the US has about 80 million doses of AstraZeneca vaccine. Eight zero, eight zero, 80, yeah. Eight yeah. zero, exactly, 80 million doses, which are already stockpiled in, in, and produced if finished in, in vials. Uh, then you have J&J, uh, which is also uh, has a contract with the US. Uh, and if you look at what's happened in terms of vaccinations in the U.S., only about 7% of the vaccinations are being with J&J vaccine, 93% is Moderna and Pfizer. But there are about 200 million uh, J&J doses that will come in the next, uh, so, next few months. So basically, there are also vaccines that countries will not use. You can think there will be a booster, but they will rely on mRNA boosters. These boosters will also likely be ones that have been adapted to maybe the flu vaccine, flu to deal with the flu at the same time, there will be, you know, it's not going to be the exact doses that exist. Uh, so there is enough, there is, um, you know, there is a lot of sources of millions of doses that can be donated even by August of this year. And what is very important, which is, you know, people flag that a very important concern that many uh, poorer nations don't have the infrastructure to be able to put those shots in arm very quickly, even if you make the vaccine supply available. And while I agree with that, which is why that's an important part of our budgeting about how you need to support that uh, prep, being prepared, it's very hard to incentivize countries to, put, to start doing that preparation when they don't have a clear sense of when they will get a big supply of vaccinations, right? And so if countries could, in the next weeks, basically, commit to, okay, by August, you will be getting X number of vaccines. I think countries can rev up preparation for it in anticipation of that. And we see that for that, that happened in a country like Bhutan, which did the preparation and in one week, you know, all of its high risk population was vaccinated. So that's doable. So that's, so I think there is a lot and more to go around at this point. And my, I'm being, I'm going to be a little more optimistic because I think now, as you've seen vaccinations ramp up in the US and in Europe, that I think countries will also feel like, okay, they are now in a more comfortable position to maybe make these commitments. Okay, um, this is a very uh, brave and also clear position that you're taking. Um, and by the way, I think the blog post was also signed by the AMF Director General, so it, 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 it's meaningful. Um, uh, but something that uh, you don't take a, a, as clear a position on is, on the debate of whether there should be a, a TRIPS waiver, essentially uh, uh, patents should be waived or not. And we have an international debate on that. The US, have, the, the US with you know, the Biden administration have taken a position. Europe is much more hesitant. You seem to be also hesitant, uh, not so much on the merits, but you don't seem to be taking a very clear position in that paper on, on this issue. Where do you stand on that? So uh, my view is, of course, firstly, I, I support any initiative that's trying to leave no stone unturned 
in terms of ending this pandemic. So it's very important to look at all possible avenues and the waiver is one such avenue to, to discuss and to, to figure out how you can, what can be done on that front. But this pl proposal that we have is we use the word, it's, it's a pragmatic proposal. So we are in a bit of a race against time. And what we know right now is that when it comes to vaccines, it's not just about the waiver, but it has to come with technology transfers too. There, are, there is a time lag for that to happen. Uh, and so I think these are important debates and discussions to have, and, it's, and especially for the future uh, in the next round and preparing for the next round of the pandemic. But as of now, uh, I would say that the important constraints on the problem are the fact that there is inequitable distribution of the current supply of vaccines that's in the pipeline. There are problems with supply chain uh, breakdowns, which is shortages of raw materials, which has to be fixed. And so if we can get these different pieces done, then I think we're getting to the goal at least of ending this pandemic. But again, I think there's the bigger issue of uh, waivers about what happens when you have a lot of public investment that led to the development of the vaccines what should be the pricing then or, or at which those vaccines are sold? These are all very good questions that should be discussed, but we're focused on the here and now uh, in this particular proposal. Okay, okay, okay. Um, uh, let's turn for a minute to not so much the, you know, the vaccination campaign, but the, the, not only the economic consequences of the pandemic, but also the economic policy consequences of the pandem pandemic, because one might argue that uh, a big difference uh, uh, compared to, you know, the, the financial crisis uh, 12 years ago is that, or, or 13 years ago, is that this time around uh, issues around inequality as much more are much more keenly felt also by policymakers. Uh, there is no doubt pan the pandemic has increased inequality even within developed countries, but there is an interesting debate on taxation, progressive taxation, uh, and also taxation of the over-the-top uh, companies, especially, you know, multi-technologic multinationals and so on. Um, what do you make of this debate? There is a proposal on the table by the US administration. Do you think this uh, first step to reach an agreement, at least uh, within the G20, a very important lesson that's been learned from this pandemic, and I think countries agree to, is the fact that the future cannot look exactly like the past. And so we want to build it towards a society that's more inclusive, where there is sufficient production of public goods, public services, health, education, strong social safety nets. Uh, so that because we know that countries that have this kind of uh, these kinds of safety nets, these kinds of unemployment insurance oh, did much better in the pandemic than others did. So once you know that and you're going to build forward to that kind of a society, obviously the question is you will need the revenues for it to make sure that you can deliver on that, on that kind of society. And in addition, the important work of uh, dealing with the climate crisis, building digital infrastructure. So all of that is very valuable, but we need sources of uh, revenue for that. So that, I think that's why it's very important, this push to have a global minimum corporate tax is an important initiative. I think there are clearly practical issues that one has to deal with in terms of what exactly that minimum tax rate is going to be. But we know that for almost all countries, regardless of what their actual corporate tax rate is, the effective amount of corporate tax revenues that they collect is a tiny fraction of the actual tax rate. So I think moving towards a global agreed uh, minimum will be very useful in, in get, making sure you get the revenues that multinationals pay their fair share of taxes. That also applies to the new kinds of digital economy and you know, tax, making sure that they are paying their fair share of taxes. There are going to be countries, uh, especially low and middle income countries, which have the unfinished business of making sure they have enough tax capacity, right? I mean, in the, in the past, that has been a problem. They're not able to collect enough tax revenues. They have to continue doing that. So in addition to progressivity, they need to build up enough uh, uh, taxation capacity. They need to accelerate that process. 
Uh, and then, and yes, in terms of progressivity, be it income tax, be it property tax, be it inheritance taxes, carbon uh, taxes, carbon pricing is a very important part of the uh, solution in terms of raising revenues. So yes, I think that, you know, to be consistent with countries' agreed objective of having sustainable, inclusive growth, you need to have a tax revenue architecture that is consistent uh, with that. You cannot rely on deficits, even if you're a country that can borrow very cheaply in the world. This is not the last crisis. There is going to be, as we've known, we've moved from the global financial crisis to this crisis and debt levels have just continued to rise. So you will have to have a medium term fiscal framework and revenue sources, in addition to expenditure rationalization, will have to play an important role. This, is, this doesn't sound very much like the IMF that used to know when I was younger, uh, uh, always preaching lower taxation uh, on, on corporates. Uh, anyway, uh, this is an interesting uh, new development because the IMF has been proposing and actually uh, putting pressure on governments to actually spend more and don't care about deficits and public debt so much. And, and I think you have uh, been taken even too seriously by some of the governments, uh, even in the US. I was wondering whether uh, you would like to compare the overall US fiscal response to the euro area fiscal response, because okay, it, it is very hard to compare because we know we have you know automatic stabilizers in Europe that uh, in the US are not necessarily there. But uh, there is a criticism that uh, the euro area would be doing too little compared to the US. Would you share that assessment? So, firstly, Federico, given how unique this crisis was, it's a pandemic. It's not a consequence of countries following unsustainable fiscal policies. But it, is, it was very clear that this was the time that countries and governments needed to spend to make sure that basic personal lives were saved, livelihoods were saved, and the economy was somehow kept as much intact as possible so that once the health crisis ends, you can have a strong recovery. In our most recent April World Economic Outlook, we are now looking at a world where we're seeing very strong recoveries in different parts of the world. So for instance, in the US, we are seeing a very strong recovery. Uh, you, I would describe the Euro area, for instance, as following closely, maybe with a few months uh, lag. Uh, and so therefore our recommendation at this point is that countries need to have well calibrated policies, targeted, you know, calibrated to where they are in the recovery cycle and well-targeted measures, right? So that would be the, that's been our prescription as of now, and also to have sound medium-term fiscal frameworks, regardless of whether you're a country that is a reserve currency issuer or not. In your question in terms of the relative uh, spending on the fiscal side, indeed the US has done one of the largest amounts of fiscal stimulus than any country advanced economy has done in, I can't remember how long. So, you know, that is having clearly accelerating the recovery in the US. But if I think of uh, the, the euro area relative to the, to the US, for me, the big source of difference in terms of the speed of recovery comes one from the differential speed of vaccinations. It, there's, it, now it's going well. In the past, it was going slower in the euro area and, and in the EU. Uh, but the, I think they're catching up. The EU is catching up. And so that's going to happen in a, in a few months from now. The second is that the, the stringency of lockdowns were harder in the, in, in the EU. Uh, and also the behavioral reaction was such that you got much more negative effects. Let me give you a simple example. For instance, in January and February of this year, when in the US and in uh, the EU, you had a big escalation of cases. The US, even the mobility did not, you know, mobility stayed where it was. You saw the services sector recover very quickly. While on the other hand, that didn't happen in the EU. Uh, and so we, have a, we had a recession in the first quarter for your area, and you have very high growth in the US in the first quarter. So that's another source of difference. But I think these will iron out. So I don't think it's the fiscal gap that's the source of the big difference in, in our projections, but it is the pace of vaccination, uh, and it's about adaptability of the different sectors to uh, 
kind of low mobility. And then I would, of course, add there is the EU Recovery Fund, which is very important. It's a, it's a very large initiative. If that rolls out as projected, we, we would see stronger recoveries. In the very few minutes that uh, we are left, um, uh, I'd like to ask you about uh, inflation. There is a debate with people usually having uh, opposite views. Some people are all over the place about the new concern, the, the new inflationary era. Other uh, people are pointing out that maybe this is a one-off effect and maybe semiconductors will be back to you know normal level of supply by September. And this is essentially one uh, single event that should not uh, worry uh, us too much. Where do you stand in this debate? I, I think I'm closer to the second set of uh, arguments. Uh, for the so it, you may, you placed it exactly right, which is your concern. One's concern about inflation is very closely tied to how much you think. Uh, transitory increase in inflation, which we all expect, will then shift inflation expectations in such a way that we're now in a new regime where people expect ongoing inflation to be at the kind of transitory inflation levels, right? Uh, it is hard based on every evidence that we've known over the last several decades uh, and seeing where these disruptions are coming from, where the inflation is coming from to make the argument that we will actually de-anchor inflation expectations and somehow move to that new regime. So I think that that is, uh, you know, if I had to bet, I would bet on things behaving, being perfectly regular in 20 to end of 2022, 23, for sure. But there will be a transitory time when inflation will be higher, but it will go back down. It's not like it's going to go up and stay, and stay high. Now, at the same time, of course, you know, while I would put the highest probability on that particular outcome, this is a very unique crisis. We've never seen anything like this before. The recovery is very unique. Some of the supply bottlenecks seem to be lasting longer than we had expected it would. For so we have to see how that feeds. Which ones? Can you mention? So, for instance, I would say in terms of you know the, the semiconductor shortages, which is, you know, we know that it takes time to build up new semiconductor facilities. But as we as we should see people's demand moving away from goods towards services. Because that's part of been that's been part of the reason why you have such shortages. That hopefully that will come will uh, that shortage will get uh, alleviated over time by the end of this year or so. Second is on uh, commodity prices. Though we are nowhere near where it was in terms of prices, oil prices, but still there's been an increase in commodity prices. An important part of that has been yes the increase in, in demand, but also the fact that supply has been kept constrained uh, so far, right? I mean, you have the OPEC plus deal, that is still an operation. So that's an important factor. So the question is, how long will it take for these different pieces uh, to change? There's that uncertainty around that and whether that will feed into inflation expectations. But yes, yeah, so I guess, you know, I'm in more in the camp of, if I had to make a prediction, it would be that things would be relatively well behaved in a year from now. Uh, but I do see, yes, there are, there are certainly risks. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Very insightful and interesting. I think in Trento we will be discussing what you have just said a lot. So thank you and uh, have a good day there. Thank you so much. Thanks. Bye-bye.